turn in your, well, we're going to be bouncing around in your Bible, so keep your Bibles ready, waiting, devices. Um, we're going to be in Luke 2 for a moment. We'll be over in John. So, peace on earth. Are you enjoying peace right now? I'm going to embarrass Tony. Tony, don't you relax? Are you relaxed right now? I mean, we got nothing to do except set everything up, play music, and all this stuff. And it's Christmas. And have you baked all your cookies? Have you shopped and gotten all your presents done? Are you having peace right now, Tony? <laughs> Uh huh. He 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 says a yes, but I see that's not an enthusiastic yes. None of us have peace right now. Christmas is the most hectic time of year, and studies have shown that over and over that we experience. Most of us are frazzled. We're running around. We got ten thousand things to do. You should see my list at home. I ignore it half the time, but. Uh, Mrs. Claus will be after me tonight to be doing more. I mean, tomorrow, not tonight, but tomorrow to finish decorating a tree and doing other stuff. So this time of year, it's very hard to have peace. We have so many things pulling us. So what is this peace and how do we find it? Luke 2. 14, glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace. So the first thing we need to discern and try to figure out is who is the recipient of this peace? Who can have this peace? You know, in some translations, it talks about, uh, I mean, it, it says, uh, and peace on earth, goodwill to men. And it, and it's, and, and, but the real, as you look at the, the Greek and, and the translation that was up on the, the screen, we look carefully at the text. This is God's peace coming upon those whom he favors, those whom he has good will, this will rest upon them. Peace among those with whom he is pleased. The God indeed wants to save everyone. Jesus teaches us this. He teaches us that I have come to save, to seek and save the lost in Luke 19:10. We know that. He wants everyone to be saved. But his peace is going to come to those who accept him, on whom his favor rests. And this may be a little confusing, but it's a great little verse that um, this, the Lord gave me that, that really helps us to understand this. And um, uh, in John, and it, it goes like this. I thank you, Jesus is rejoicing. here. Uh, John 11. He rejoiced in the spirit and he said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and the understanding and reveal them to little children, these believers. Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. Or for so it pleased you. So, in this verse, we see that these things are revealed not to the wise and the understanding, but to little children. And in this context, the little children means believers. So, who did the angels come? The, the verse we just read, glory to God in the highest. Who did these angels who are they speaking to? The wisest person then, King Solomon? Were they speaking to King Solomon? No. Were they speaking to the most powerful person there, Herod the Great? Herod the Great built many, many fabulous buildings all over the Middle East. Were they speaking to Herod the Great? No. Who were they speaking to? Shepherds. 
Shepherds are uh, most uneducated. They start working with little boys. They don't go to school. They're dirty. They're stinky. They're smelly. He comes to shepherd. Now, the rich, the famous, the bright, and the powerful all have difficulty seeing God because it's hidden. And here's a tale of two men. A tale of two men. The first one is the most, probably still one of the most brilliant people in the 20th century, um, Albert Einstein, who died in 1955. And I looked into this a little bit and read a letter he wrote to a young girl and uh, who would ask him some questions about God. And, and he struggled to understand God. Einstein said it's beyond human capability. Einstein, as brilliant as he is, spoke more than he knew. He didn't even know what he's talking about there. He really didn't. He was ignorant, this brilliant man. It's beyond human capability. Yes, duh. Of course it is. God's grace? How can we comprehend it? You have to receive this grace. So Einstein likely died an atheist. We don't know. Maybe the Lord opened his heart. I pray that he did. But here's the most brilliant man in the 20th century. And here's a second person to compare that to. Poor, poor, poor kid born in a bedroom in a little dairy farm. Charlotte, North Carolina. He, as a boy, he was unruly, in trouble a lot, had to be disciplined a lot, not the best student in the world. You know who I'm talking about here? Some of you probably do. Billy Graham. Billy Graham. And this poor, uneducated farmer's kid, on his knees with tears streaming, Accepted Jesus as his Lord and Savior. And what did God reveal to him? Not everything was revealed to him, God that God could reveal to him. So he had this peace, he had a vision, God empowered him. And so now we have on this other side the most well-known and effective evangelist for Jesus Christ in the 20th century, Billy Graham. Brilliant man, most brilliant, not so brilliant in our eyes, but brilliant God's <coughs> who used him to change the world and draw the world to Jesus. So that is the bottom line. If you don't know Jesus as your Savior, you don't have his. You will receive it when you accept him. If there is anyone here today who is struggling with faith in Christ, struggling, I don't know if I want to believe or not, I pray right now that the Lord will touch your heart. He will accept Christ. Because Christ will give you peace that you will not get without him. If there are those who are here struggling with wandering, with uh, wandered away from your faith or walking in a different direction or trying to solve your own problems, I pray right now that you will repent and return to that right relationship this day, this season because that peace will again fill your heart. Because God's peace is a gift. That's the point. It's a gift that is given to those who love Jesus, follow him, follow him Lord. It is his gift. The second thing we want to learn is what is this peace? So this peace comes to those who love Jesus and Call him Lord and Savior. But what exactly is this peace? John 14, 27 will help us understand this. Peace 
I leave with you my peace. Notice peace, peace. When Jesus says two words like that back to back, bam, he's really driving home a point. My peace I give to you, not as the world gives you, do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. The peace that we give is the peace from Messiah, Jesus. This word that is used in Greek is is the translation of shalom in Hebrew. But in the New Testament, this word typically points to salvation through Messiah. This peace is salvation through Messiah. Messiah Jesus. Shalom in Hebrew, shalom means that you are living in complete harmony with God and in the middle of his will, walking with God like Adam and Eve before the fall. That's what shalom means. They kind of pull together, meaning you can't walk like that without faith in Christ. You can't walk in God's will if you don't have that salvation, if you don't have that personal faith in Jesus, who's death on the cross and his bodily resurrection, his ascension into heaven, the sending of his Holy Spirit. Without this, you don't have peace as we just studied. But that peace means that you are walking in his will, that you have this deep abiding faith and you have this right relationship. You're in perfect conformity with what God wants you to do. That can only come through the power of the Holy Spirit, through your relationship with God. But here's here's the important thing. Not what the world gives. So there are two pieces. Peace of the world and the peace of God. This is easy to remember. The peace of the world is negative. Negative. Share an example in one second. It's the absence of conflict, the absence of war. It's a negative. The peace of God through Jesus Christ is a positive. It is a gift. It is a blessing bestowed by grace that gives you the peace of Christ. Peace of the world is a negative. Peace of God is a positive. I can illustrate this in my own life a lot. Um, this June, sorry, my nose run a little bit after. At least, at least I'm not as nasty looking as I was last week. In June, Kathy and I will celebrate our 50th wedding anniversary. Oh, she is really getting old. I mean, seriously, you think about that. That poor woman, uh, I feel sorry for her. She's so old. But we're going to celebrate our anniversary. So marriage is... Hard work, guys. I mean, sorry, but it's not it's not easy all the time. With the Lord in it, it, it is absolutely a blessing. But there have been times in our lives where we have been not walking that path. And we have had arguments, we've had fights, we've had fusses, we've had battles. And indeed, in that period in our lives as husband and wife, the peace was worldly peace. A negative, absent fight. Oh, no battle today. Thank you, Lord. That's peace. That's the world's peace. And then when the Holy Spirit convicted us and our we repented to the Lord of our sins, we apologize to each other. He restores us in that right relationship with him. And then what happens to that relationship between Kathy and I? It goes wonderful. And we are restored. And the peace we have then is a positive, it's a gift, it's a blessing that comes from Christ to us, giving us a peace that the world can't give. The peace the world gave us, remember, is no more battles. And if in in your home, if if that's your peace, that's the peace of the world. That's a negative absence of conflict. The peace Christ gives us is a positive, a blessing. It's a gift. Oh, what a wonderful gift 
that is. And yes, marriage is hard work, but Christ in the center pulls us together, keeps us in right relationship with each other because we have first had that right relationship. So God's peace brings you into the center of his will, living in that right relationship. And there's nothing that can compare to that. So God's gift is a, God's peace is a gift. It's given to those who love him, who follow him as Lord and Savior. God's peace can never come from this world because that's a negative peace. But through him, that right relationship and being centered will gives us alone, gives us God. Oh, what? The final point I want to make, I'm going to be a little short today. <laughs> Man, we got a business meeting. We got all this stuff to do. So I, I'm not that I'm feeling stressed, but we're going to, we're going to get out a little, just a little early. Well, we members won't be getting out early. We got a business, but it only takes five. Minutes. But the final point I want to make, what's the result of peace? There's a word that came to me. I, I'm sorry. I'm going to throw this out. Equanimity. Equanimity. And I, it's, a, it's a freaky little word. It just came to me. I don't know. Because equanimity, when you look at it, it means calm, steadfastness in the middle of a storm, in the middle of difficult circumstances. Equanimity. That kind of goes along with what Scripture teaches us. Now I'm going to look at John 16, 33. I've said these things to you that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation. But take heart, I have overcome the world. Do you see that? There are three contrasts in this one verse, three things that are opposing each other. In me, Jesus is saying, and in the world. Okay? In me, in world. May have, with me you may have, in the world you will have. And what will that be? Peace versus trouble. In Christ, you may, and may May have means that there are people in the world that reject Jesus. This 80-some-year-old man in hospital, his whole life has rejected Jesus. You may, in Christ, you may have peace versus in the world you will, not may. Notice, that, I mean, this is important. Will have trouble, not may. You're going to have trouble in this world, period. All of us, are. all of us have. But then he says, and I love that, take heart. That's the only time um, this particular word is used in the New Testament. It's, it, it, you remember this, take heart. It is a imperative, second person plural, and it's Imperative. That means y'all in Southern. Remember, when you translate the Greek to Southern, it comes from that verb to y'all, take heart. Y'all have heard. It's a command. It's not a suggestion. Have courage. Take heart. Why? God's commands. And this is important. We've talked about this a million times, but I want to keep pounding and pounding and pounding. When God gives you a command, there has to be something to back it up. When he gives you an imperative, an imperative is a command. Then the other verb tense is indicative, which means the, the, the character. So when he commands you, take heart, have good courage. Why? Well, why should I have courage? Next word. Because. He's already answered your question. Because I have over. 
whatever you're going through, whatever you've been through, whatever you're going to go through, Jesus has been there. And he's overcome it. And through that powerful peace that he gives you, we can have this peace, even in the midst of a storm. Um, I never really liked fishing. Sorry, Britt. I never really did. I mean, I apologize to you personally, good buddy. And fishing has been a big part of your life, but I never liked it. Um, and, but I grew up fishing. And here's a story that'll never leave my mind. We lived in Norfolk. We thought water fishing. We had a boat, 20 foot boat with outboard. And, Dad would take us out on Saturday. My brother, my, the two older brothers, my little brother, he's a little dork. He couldn't go anyway. I mean, he'd just be in trouble. I mean, sorry. But uh, so the three of us would go out fishing. And we'd go out um, in, the, in the bay and go to like the second island of the Bay Beer Bridge Tunnel. And um, on this day, we were out there almost halfway across the Chesapeake Bay, 13 miles. So that's, you know, six or eight miles out in the bay. And we'd fish around the islands to get flounder and like to fish for rockfish. And when the blues were running, we'd fish for blues. Anyway, here we are. Storm comes. And in, in the bay, Chesapeake Bay, a storm can come up like that. Okay. And here comes this storm. Whoa. And it was blowing in. So he said, pull up your lines. And we took off and he started going back to our harbor at Cobbs Marina, right near Little Creek Amphibious Base. Um, and so the, the wind picked up. And so what happens out in the middle of the Chesapeake Bay? The waves pick up, the white can. And I remember as a kid, Dad was up front, and in and, and that boat, you know, we were, it was a, a trailing sea. He was heading over here to the shore, to our harbor, and the wind was coming this way. So these big, bigger waves, they'd come up behind the boat, and they'd lift up the boat, and then we'd get through that one. And I kept thinking, man, this thing is going to break over the top of the boat. We're going down. I mean, that's all I could think of. Well, every now and then, because I'm looking back, I'm looking at all these waves coming. That's all I'm looking at. Oh, is this one going to kill me? And, and I looked up at my dad. And he wasn't looking back. He, he had his hands on the wheel. He, he, Steer yourself over those waves. You maneuver so you don't put your bow in the water. And he was looking dead ahead where we needed to go. Raining, but he, we got close enough. You, he, and he knew where we needed to go, and he was looking straight ahead. And the word that came to my mind, equanimity, not then, equanimity. I didn't know that word. All right. But when I thought about that, as an example, I said, that's equanimity. That's peace. He was a man of God, a pastor, wonderful, wonderful man. Great dad. He kept that boat pointed straight at harbor. And that was all he was going to do. He didn't care what was coming behind him. He didn't look back at those waves that were terrifying me. He looked forward. Safe harbor. He got it. That is because of our risen Lord. The peace he gave my day. It's what storms are you battling? What storms are in your life? There may be things in your home life. There may be things in your work. There may be things. I don't know what you're bad. Medical, financial. What storms are you? And what direction are you looking at? And what direction are your eyes? Are you looking behind? Like me, with those big waves 
and just looking back at all your problems and all the horrible things that you are dealing with, is that where you're looking? Or are you looking forward today at the safe harbor Jesus gives you? Because we all have storms. We all have storms in our life. And some of you may be having storms right now. And if you're looking at the waves, your fear would wash you over like that. Looking in the wrong place. But that's where we are as humans. That's, you know that. This little kid, I didn't know any better. I just was watching those waves afraid they're going to kill me. We need to look forward. Safe heart. With Jesus. And through his power, Holy Spirit, we will have equanimity. We will, in the middle of the storm, will be like my dad. Focus, safe, even. God's peace is a gift. It's given to those who love him and call him their Lord. God's gift can never come to us. His peace can never come from this world. The world's peace is a negative peace. God's peace is a positive blessing, a gift. And He can give you this peace and this equanimity. He can give you this peace in the middle of any storm you're battling in right now. Anything the world can throw at you, we are to take heart, commanded, take heart, be of good courage, be calm. Big calm, these work. No matter what we are, then lifted. Well, I pray right now that you have this peace. And if you do not, if you're struggling or have not professed Christ as your Savior, please talk. These over. Pray with me.